at uh, Daniel Seidel from the University of Florida. And um, the title of his talk is uh, CH Functionalization of Cyclic Secondary Amines. Okay, thank you very much, Hugh, for the invitation and the excellent opportunity to share some of our research with the broader community. So my group has a long-standing interest in the CH functionalization of amines. And the main challenge here, of course, is that these bonds are not particularly activated. Also, this sometimes is a little bit underappreciated is the fact that the presence of an H bond, an amine H bond, can be problematic. In fact, most current methods are incompatible with the presence of this functionality, and therefore they are limited oftentimes to tertiary or protective amines. So we've made it our goal to try to identify new strategies that would allow us to functionalize cyclic uh, unprotected amines, ideally only using inexpensive catalysts or promoters. And the hope here is that this would have a positive impact uh, and expand the toolbox for total synthesis and also medicinal chemistry, where these heterocycles, of course, are, are highly prevalent. So today's talk is focused on secondary amines. I want to start with a very brief overview here. Of course, cyclic uh, secondary amines, for instance, pyrrolidine have a very long history in organic chemistry. Uh, typically, in the presence of an acid catalyst, they readily condense with aldehydes to form aminimines, which can then be captured with a variety of different nucleophiles. But many of them have name reactions associated with them that we're all familiar with from sophomore undergrad chemistry. So what my group's been doing uh, really in, in earnest since about 2012 or so is to take essentially the same starting materials, but now incorporate a CH bond functionalization step that leads us to these regio isomers of these classic products. So these are redox neutral methods for CH functionalization. And one way to think about them is that essentially we are combining a reductive N alkylation with an oxidative upper functionalization here. So how did we get started on this chemistry? Now, for a moment, if you consider linking the aldehyde to the nucleophile via two carbon chain, the classic condensation product would require you to make a fairly unfavorable strained four membered ring. Whereas what we refer to as the, the redox annulation product it gives, gives you a nice stable six membered ring. And in fact, it was such a reaction that we initially discovered by accident about 10 years ago. And how this came to be is, is summarized in this uh, synthesis article from 2013. Now, most of these reactions uh, greatly are accelerated or require the presence of a carboxylic acid as a catalyst or promoter, sometimes even as a, as a co-solvent. So we have a pretty good idea of how these reactions work. We think that initially you have the aldehyde and the amine form this hemiaminal in, in equilibrium. And in the presence of acetic acid, for instance, you can access this, this N-O-acetal. And this is now a very interesting uh, essentially paracyclic type reaction pathway available where this can grab a proton while being eliminated as acetic acid to form this, this azomethanolate. And this can now be recaptured essentially by exocyclic protonation and then the acetate attaches itself to the ring to form this regioisomeric N-O-acetal. So this is a way to equilibrate these two uh, um, N-O-acetals with one another. And now the nucleophile can come in, displace the acetate group to leading to the ring substituted product. Now, this is very much happening in competition with the classic process. And unfortunately, you cannot decouple these processes. You have to have the nucleophile present from the beginning of the reaction. So you have to use all kinds of tricks to guide the reaction toward this desired pathway, which I can't have, like, get into today because of time reasons. Now, if you don't have nucleophile present, this acetal can undergo a variety of reactions. For instance, it can eliminate acetic acid to access an enamine. These species can undergo rapid dimerization, ultimately actually polymerization. So these are rapidly taken out of the equilibrium here. The enamine being a good nucleophile can also react with the aldehyde starting material to form these kinds of species, which can ultimately undergo elimination of water and, re and uh, rearrangement to lead to the fully aromatized uh, parole type uh, systems. Now we've obtained evidence for some of these species. For instance, we've isolated and gotten X-ray structures of these enamine dimers. But we've also showed by trapping experiments that these azomethanolates are involved in these reactions. In fact, this, this conjugated azomethanolate is on the path to the formation of this uh, parole compound. 
So of course, uh, paracyclic reactions are what azomethanolids are mostly known for. But I would argue that uh, this type of redox isomerization chemistry is much older than any reported paracyclic reaction of azomethanolids. In fact, the earliest examples we found so far go back to this paper by, by Rukheimer from 1891, where they've taken this n benzoyl piperidine, exposed this to benzaldehyde under need conditions to ultimately get this fully aromatized um, disubstituted pyridine. And we think the first step here is cleavage of the amide bond to release uh, benzoic acid, which can then catalyze this transformation. Now we've mostly focused on, on this pathway here, and we've been able to mirror classic organic reactions as the Strecker reaction, also the Friedel-Crafts alkylation reaction, as well as Manic reaction and others. And, and here we have a reasonably broad substrate scope. The main limitation in all of these reactions is that you essentially limited to uh, non enolizable aldehydes. Sometimes you require special aldehydes. And oftentimes you see small amounts of the corresponding classic condensation products uh, and in competition. So it turns out that the annulations I mentioned uh, are typically much easier to perform. They also have a product scope and arguably those are the more useful transformations because they allow you to rapidly access polycyclic uh, ring systems. So for instance, we've been able to show that you can make uh, CN bonds, CC bonds, uh, and also CO and CS bonds in alpha position by choosing appropriately functionalized benzaldehydes. We've applied this to CC bond functionalization. Here's an early example where we've been able to show that you can do a redox version of the classic piglet spangler reaction to get access to these polycyclic frameworks quite rapidly. Most of our work has been on activated orthotolyl aldehydes, and this melanate substrate, for instance, can be used uh, fairly efficiently to access tetrahydroprotoberberine type natural products. More recently, we have shown that uh, a single nitrogen in the ring is sufficiently activating for a methyl group that now these redox annulations can also proceed uh, with these species. You can also activate a methyl group by having electron withdrawing groups on the ring, typically that's limited to two nitro groups in this particular case. So we're not limited to six membered ring formation. We can also fuse uh, new five membered ring systems onto the existing uh, amine framework. And a breakthrough was really the ability to show that we can also use enolizable aldehydes, which is not possible in the three component type reactions. So for instance, using uh, four nitro or nitrobutyraldehydes that are easily available in an anti enriched form in one step by organic catalysis methods, we can ring fuse these onto, for instance, tetrahydroisoquinoline to access these species with, with good diastereous activities, preserving the initial EE of the starting material. Now, this was also a similar reaction. We, we showed that we can use beta ketoaldehydes. And here we have a very simple synthesis of the commercial drug uh, tetrabenazine. We've also explored to some extent the enamine type chemistry. And here we are able to show, for instance, that enamines formed in situ can undergo heterodeals all the type reactions to make these fairly complex uh, polycyclic frameworks in one step from simple starting materials. Now, in the past few years, we have shifted our focus to reactions where the starting materials are also secondary means, but the products remain secondary means, basically just introducing one alpha substituent. And surprisingly, few methods can, can achieve that. And until very recently, the only game in town here was really uh, hydroamino alkylation, where you essentially uh, add the alpha CH bond across an olefin uh, to form an alpha or to introduce an alpha branched alkyl substituent onto the system. And this happens in this case in very excellent diastereous activity. This, these reactions are catalyzed typically by these kinds of tantalum complexes. Now, unfortunately, because of the fairly high temperature and non-reaction times here, these reactions uh, are fairly limited with regard to the functional group tolerance that can be achieved here. Now, very recently, uh, Shannon Stahl's group has reported a very nice uh, electrochemical approach to alpha cyanation and using a range of uh, four substituted um, piperidines, they've shown that this reaction is uh, tolerant to a whole range of, of functional groups. That's a very nice way to make uh, amino acids from these uh, frameworks. Now, some years ago, we became aware of some very interesting but possibly forgotten chemistry 
that was explored by the Wittig group in the 60s and early 70s of last century. So one reaction they reported is that if you take lithiated diethylamine and expose this to benzophenone, you can obtain this interesting CH functionalized product here. And what they proposed as the mechanism is something similar to the Meerwein point of Verley reduction, where you have this hydride transfer onto the ketone that leads to the oxidation of the lithium amide to the amine and the sub subsequent, uh, the simultaneous formation of the corresponding lithium oxide. Now we think this mechanism is actually quite reasonable. Uh, once you have the, the imine, this can now be deprotonated rapidly by the starting material to make this metalloenamine, which you can also view as a one azl anion. And this then simply adds to the benzophenone starting material to form the corresponding aldol type uh, product. So they also noted in a subsequent paper that uh, lithium pyrrolidite rapidly reduces benzophenone at zero degrees to form the corresponding alcohol. However, in this case, they did not observe this expected aldol uh, type product. However, when they changed the acceptor to this aniline derived imine, they curiously, they found that they can form this three substituted parole in fairly good yields. And the idea here is that you access this um, azl anion, which can then add to the imine. Ultimately, you end up losing aniline rearrange bonds around and you end up with the fully aromatized uh, parole type product. Now we were wondering, can we utilize this method to make imines in situ and then perhaps capture them by organolithium compounds, for instance, to in a simple one part procedure form these two substituted uh, heterocycles. Now reading uh, the Wittig papers, everything seemed to suggest that deprotonation would be the more rapid step. And if this was the case, it would be quite difficult to develop uh, this chemistry. So all the products they ever isolated were consistent with the intermediacy of these one azl anions. Now these imines of course are well known, you can access them in many other ways, but typical procedures where you would access them would uh, be at higher temperatures where these imines undergo really rapid trimerization. And these trimers have been shown to be very stable to uh, organolithium compounds, for instance, even by heating this with phenolithium, you would get no reaction. So long story short, we were quite fortunate. This, this reaction worked quite nicely. You can simply take, for instance, pyrrolidine, deprotonate this with butylithium minus 78 degrees, followed by the addition of, of benzophenone. And we know that right away, this, this hydride transfer step is, is really rapid. So we only have to wait for about 10 minutes at minus 78 degrees, followed by addition of phenolithium to isolate this 2 phenylpyrrolidine in moderate yield. But considering uh, the ease of the reaction, we think this is quite valuable. So we also looked at some control experiments. For instance, we mixed the pyrrolidine with the ketone and then simply add an excess of phenolithium, which now acts as the base as well as the nucleophile. And the fact that we get almost the same yield for this approach shows us that the deprotonation and subsequent hydride transfer must be significantly faster than the well-known addition of a phenolithium to benzophenone. So we, we now know that the, based on reactor or studies that the hydride transfer takes uh, less than 15 seconds at minus 78 degrees. So this is as close as we can measure this because uh, we can only measure a spectrum about every 15 seconds. So it's a really, really fast process. So it turns out that the scope, uh, which was published last year uh, is quite broad with regard to different uh, amine ring sizes. Uh, the size really doesn't matter here. And we can introduce different uh, arrow groups Header L groups can be introduced. Alkenol groups work as well. We can introduce also alkyl groups. And the functional group tolerance is basically what you would expect based on the fact that we're using highly reactive organolithium uh, compounds here. So if you have four substituted, uh, sorry, four substituted pyridines or these kind of bicyclic amines, we can functionalize them with very high levels of diastase activity. So we also used some intermediates that are used for the synthesis of these two commercial drugs and showed that these can also be functionalized uh, with very good levels of, of diastereo uh, selectivity. Now, what's truly unique about this method is that we can use uh, starting materials that already have one alpha substituent present. And uh, with very high levels of reduced selectivity and typically very high levels of diastereo selectivity, we can simply introduce a, a substituent in the alpha prime 
position. This is quite unique. I think there's no other method currently available that would allow you to, to achieve that. So based on the mechanism of the transformation, this, this reaction is highly stereospecific. So one nice aspect is if we start with the non-enriched materials, the corresponding products here uh, maintain the EE of the starting material. And we utilize this in a very short synthesis of the small alkaloid solenopsin A simply by popping an undecal group onto two methyl piperidine, which is fairly easy to, to obtain in highly enriched uh, form. So more recently in unpublished work, uh, we, we thought about that after the first addition of the nuclear, first nucleophile, we again obtain a lithium amide. So we thought, what if we add a second uh, hydride acceptor now, followed by addition of another nucleophile? So we, we've done this, and we show now that in a single pot operation, we can make two six diphenylpiperidine as a single diastereomer in, in fairly good yield. And the, the yield actually is higher than the original paper reported for the addition of uh, one phenyl group. And the reasons for these are that we further improve the procedure for the initial uh, reaction, but also then the second group gives you a product that's less volatile, allowing better isolation. Now this works also for pyrrolidine, for instance, and we don't have to use the same nucleophile, of course, we can also do this with two different nucleophiles so we can get two different substituents in the corresponding alpha positions. Now, in our initial report, uh, we were fairly disappointed to see that many valuable nucleophiles, for instance, lithium acetylides, enolates, but most importantly, Grignard reagents failed to give uh, good results. So we, we thought about how can we improve the scope of these transformations. And we became aware of studies by actually several groups, but really the persons uh, who really pushed this chemistry forward is Dave Collins' group, who showed that you can activate imines with BF3 ether rate under carefully controlled conditions. Now, if you try to add phenyl lithium acetylide here to this imine, there's no reaction even at room temperature or higher temperatures, but there's a very, very rapid addition in presence of B3 ether rate, even at minus uh, 85 degrees. Now, it's very important how you do this reaction. If you just pre-mix the B3 ether rate with the uh, nucleophile for just five minutes at minus 85 degrees, you end up getting these borates, which will no longer participate in this reaction. So some concern we had that the coordination of BF3 to our enolizable imines would greatly acidify this beta proton, which was a potential problematic for us. And also we have these lithium oxides, which could also interact with the BF3 etherate. So long story short, uh, this chemistry works very nicely with uh, lithium compounds that previously failed to react. So for instance, this compound comes from the corresponding organolithium species, which shows no reaction in the absence of BF3. And I should point out, it's very important that we add the BF3 immediately after we get the organolithium uh, compound. So this order of addition is quite important. And this can also work very nicely for the corresponding additions of uh, acetylides. Now using a slightly different Lewis acid, TMS triflate, we can also extend the scope to Grignard reagents here. And we use this uh, large amine to introduce these smaller type substituents simply to have something that would be less volatile to isolate and give us more accurate yields for these steps. And finally, we also have been able to show that uh, reagents prepared via the turbo Grignard method allow us to introduce uh, functional groups that otherwise would be incompatible with, uh, with this chemistry. Now, more recently, we've been trying to really push the scope with regard to the kinds of nucleophiles we can use. And one reaction I want to highlight here, we've shown that we can, again, access this, this imine in situ and then quench the reaction by TMS cyanide to get convenient access uh, and very good isotopicity if this amino nitrile compound. And I think this is quite complementary to the chemistry that the Stahl group has developed. Uh, and it's kind of unique because uh, I would argue that pretty much any other oxidation method that you would use would actually get you to the imine on the side of the phenyl ring because this benzylic CH bond is significantly more activated than this uh, CH bond over in this position. Now we can also do this in a one part procedure. We can simply introduce the phenyl group uh, first, uh, add more hydride acceptor and then quench with TMS cyanide to in one part now get this difunctionalized compound still in, in fairly good uh, yield. And this reaction also works with other nucleophiles, as you might imagine. For instance, we can introduce this uh, phosphine ester 
into the compound also with fairly good levels of, uh, of efficiency. Now, we've also wondered, can we extend this, uh, the scope of this reaction further in a new direction by using organolithium nucleophiles that have a leaving group attached to them? So now once after the first addition, this uh, lithium amide could now displace this leaving group to ultimately form a ring annulated product. And the scope of this you would hope would be quite different from the one that we can achieve with the redox annulation approach. Now we found some precedent uh, for uh, linear uh, non-inalizable imines that had been used in combination with these uh, orthomethylbenzamides, which can be deprotonated by LDA and then added to the imine to form these lactams in low to, to good yields. And we realized that the, the reason for that, once we started looking at this reaction, we found the reason for these oftentimes low yields is actually fairly unexpected case and condensation where the uh, deprotonated starting material would engage unreacted starting material to form this undesired ketone byproduct. So by controlling the deprotonation, we were able to actually establish a fairly broad scope for this reaction with a variety of different imines, which again, we prepared in situ. So we're happy to see that uh, lots of different ring sizes again are accommodated here. And so these, this access to polycyclic lactams is uh, significantly faster than most other methods you can probably think about for making these kinds of compounds. So this method all tolerates uh, substituents on this arrow ring. So all kinds of different groups can be placed here in different positions. We can also have a pyridine ring here, for instance, or a furan. And we can make more complex compounds by using bicyclic amines. Here we get very good levels of diastereous activity. Uh, fortunately, four substituted piperidines also give very nice levels of, of DR in this case. And we can also introduce substituents in various other positions uh, as well. We are further wondering, uh, can we access other reaction partners by lithium halogen exchange where we have a leaving group on this ortho methyl group of this aryl halide. And uh, once we have this compound, we would again add in situ formed imine to now access these polycyclic isoindolines. And uh, these are actually quite privileged frameworks in medicinal chemistry and when you look for compounds with the substructure with five membered rings here, six, seven, or even eight membered rings, you will find many hits and many reported biological activities for these kinds uh, of compounds. So it turns out by using this cheap commercially available uh, bromo, um, uh, bromo starting material here, we can simply do lithium halogen exchange with butyl lithium, followed by the imine uh, addition, which again was prepared in situ. And we could show that again, the scope is quite, uh, quite good here. And this allows a significantly simplified approach to these compounds. Again, if for substituted uh, piperidines, we have good diastereous activities. The same is true for these uh, bicyclic uh, amines. So the last uh, couple of slides, I want to share uh, some exciting new results we've achieved, where we're now targeting the beta position of the amines. So remember, I told you about this interesting observation by Wittig, where they access these four substituted uh, parole compounds in a one part process. So we thought if we can actually purposely generate these metalloenamines, we might be able to alkylate them in the beta position, hopefully preventing aromatization from occurring. And surprisingly, there's very, very little known with regard to cyclic azoyl anions. So presumably these species are quite strained and uh, difficult to control in terms of their reactivity. Of course, uh, for acyclic metalloenamines, they have a very rich history. They are known to, of course, really, really good um, nucleophiles for alpha alkylation reactions. So if we were able to achieve this with the corresponding cyclic amines, there are actually numerous uh, drug molecules that have benzyl groups in the corresponding beta positions uh, of the ring. Okay, so it turns out that we found that you can make the imine in situ as usual and then LDA is uh, useful to deprotonate them to form the corresponding azoyl anion. The solution turns slightly yellow in this case. Then we alkylate this with, with benzobromide. And if you simply do a reductive workup with sodium borohydride, we can now access this three benzopiperidine in, in fairly good uh, yields. We can also uh, utilize the presence of this imine to add another nucleophile, for instance, phenyl lithium. And upon workup, we can now obtain in a single part operation a very good yield of this uh, disubstituted uh, piperidine 
with a reasonably promising diastasis activity. So then we got uh, carried away a little bit and we thought, well, what if we add a hydroid acceptor at this point, we should be able to form regioselectively this imine. And indeed, when we quenched such a reaction with butyl lithium, we were able to now introduce uh, three different substituents and still obtain fairly good yields and a reasonable level of diastereo selectivity. So we've done this with a number of substrates and we could show that we can introduce a whole range of uh, groups in the beta position. We've also have numerous examples uh, of uh, difunctionalization where we introduce a fairly broad variety of groups. And we have done a few more examples of these trifunctionalization reactions. So uh, this is currently uh, under review. So with that, I'm left with the most important slide of all. So I'm extremely grateful to my uh, highly dedicated and hardworking coworkers who made all this work uh, possible. I wanna point out a few people here specifically, many more have contributed over the years. So Dr. Shen Zhang, a former graduate student of mine, actually one of my first graduate students discovered the, the redox annulation and developed its early scope. This is really what got us going in this chemistry. Uh, Dr. Long Le Ma and Dr. Wei Chi Chen, both uh, former graduate students of mine, uh, were instrumental in developing the hydride uh, transfer chemistry. They both also did a lot of work on the redox chemistry. Wei Chi was now here shown in the back. He is now an excellent postdoc in my group who has been uh, uh, instrumental, very critical to essentially uh, almost all the hydride transfer projects I talked about uh, today. I also want to point out uh, Ani Rudral Paul. So Ani is shown in the front here. He's a fantastic graduate student who has been critically involved in all of the hydride transfer projects I talked about uh, today. And he also did a fair amount of work on the redox chemistry. And so watch out for this guy. He's actually currently looking for postdoc is soon sending out applications. So you'd be a great catch for anybody you have. So I'm also grateful to our collaborators, Dr. Martin Boix and Professor Ken Hauck who really have helped us to develop an understanding of this chemistry. And I'm uh, grateful to the University of Florida for basically giving us a second chance as, at life, so to speak, for, buying able, for enabling us to buy some shiny new equipment which really has pushed this chemistry uh, forward. I'm also very grateful to the NIH for their continued support of our research efforts. And I wanna make one final comment. So we're currently actually looking for a new postdoc so if any of you would like to join us, please uh, send me an email. And finally, thank you for listening. Uh, well, Daniel, an amazing talk. It's, a, it's a spectacular how you've built on the concept and uh, expanded it in so many different ways. It's uh, very impressive indeed. Um, I have a, a couple of questions for you. Um, one is, uh, is from Nick uh, Chiappini from Stanford. Uh, have you had any success with azetidine functionalization via the hydride acceptor methodology? Does it all okay. funnel to the two azetine the tautoma? Right. So that's a very good question. So we've only, I'm embarrassed to admit, we've only looked at this very briefly, but there's definitely something we're going to go back to. So I can't really report any progress on this so far, unfortunately. Another, and, and another question from Nick. Uh, Nick, Nick is actually um, uh, always asks wonderful questions in, in the CCHF. So I'm not surprised we've got two questions from it. So the second question is, um, can you trap the amines generated via lithium amide methodology with non-organometallic nucleophiles? Such yes. as MS trifluoromethylate. For instance, works, but we can also do some other ones. So ketones work to some extent as well, and this is something we're currently trying to to broaden the scope of. Okay, one final question uh, from Wenbin here at Emory: Have you tried uh, quinucleidines? Quinucleidines? No, we have not tried those. But thank you for that suggestion. Well, great, Daniel. Thanks very much for, for joining us. A very, very uh, thoughtful presentation, and it's amazing what you've achieved. Congratulations. Thank you very much.